Hello, everybody. Welcome to our Scholars Hub at Home. My name is Joanne Hui, and I am the Alumni Engagement and Events Officer here at the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Thank you so much for joining us today for our session titled BC and the York B Collection, Globally Recognized Research at York University. For those that may not know, BC is the acronym for the Center of Bee Ecology, Evolution, and Conservation. This webinar is part of our Scholars Hub speaker series, which features timely and relevant educational lectures by academics and researchers at York University. Today, our Scholars Hub is in partnership with the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change in celebration of Bee Day. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land that York's campuses are built on. As this event is virtual and we are all not gathered in the same space, I recognize that the following land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. If this is the case, please take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and its current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon the York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations. This area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. I am grateful for the opportunity to live and work on Treaty 13 land. For more information, please visit native-land.ca. So let's get started. We'd like to get to know our audience a little bit uh, with a quick poll before each of our lectures. Our question today for you is, how would you rate your current knowledge on today's topic? A poll should pop up on your screen right now, and I'll give everybody a moment to respond. So please respond if it's very high, somewhat informed, minimal, or if you're new to this topic. And in that case, welcome all. So we have majority of folks somewhat informed, 11% very high, 32% minimal, and 16% new to this topic. So welcome all, and thank you so much for participating for our pre-event poll. This is really helpful for us and our speakers to have an idea of who's in our audience today and the knowledge that you each have about the topic for the discussion for today's event. Since we are on Zoom webinar, uh, please feel free to kick click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your window and screen and enter any questions that you may have. Our team is ready to help you. That same button can also be used to submit questions for our guest speakers uh, to answer during the Q&A period following their presentation today. For those that are tuning in live on Facebook, feel free to submit any questions and comments that you may have through the comment section on Facebook and our team will send them our way. So to begin today's event, I'd like to welcome Alice J. Horvorka, the Dean of Environmental and Urban Change, to give some updates from our faculty and introduce our guest speakers, Professor Lawrence Parker, Packer and Victoria McPhail. Alice, it's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Joanne, uh, and wonderful to be here. Uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, welcome to this uh, wonderful event that we have focused on bees and with Lawrence and Victoria as our experts. I did wanna give a shout out to uh, the Faculty of Science and on behalf of Dean uh, Ree Wang, uh, we do a lot of collaborations with the Faculty of Science and BC, uh, that uh, organized research uh, unit that Joanne mentioned is something that is um, a culmination of uh, faculty and staff and students from both of our faculties. Um, but in terms of an EUC update, we've been busy. Um, you might know that we're the newest faculty at York University, and uh, we have recently launched our inaugural EUC impact report. 
So rather than me telling you about what our impact has been in the areas of experiential education for students, research excellence, championing equity and inclusion, and uh, advancing the UN SDGs, I encourage you to read the report. Uh, Joanne has put that link in the chat. Um, but in terms of more relevance to today's session, I wanted to mention two things that have been going on. One uh, is that just this past week on May 16th, um, BC and EUC, that's a lot of acronyms, uh, but BC and EUC hosted a garden party um, led by Victoria McPhail and uh, sponsored in part by the World Wildlife Fund Canada. Um, and this was an open house and a revitalization effort for our native plant garden. And the EUC Native Plant Garden is uh, a home for local um, flora and fauna and is one of our EUC living labs, which means it's a classroom, a research site, and a site of community engagement. And it was wonderful to see all kinds of folks from across the university coming out to help with that revitalization. So thank you, Victoria, for all your, all your efforts to that end. Uh, and I also wanted to mention another large uh, collaboration we have with the Faculty of Science, which is on our Bachelor of Science Environmental Science program, which will be entering into its third year. And we really um, revamped that program with colleagues in the Faculty of Science, focusing on two main themes of biodiversity conservation and biodiversity and conservation and environmental change. And we've been highlighting all kinds of experiential education um, through that program. I have to say one of the, one of the uh, things that students always tell me as they're working through their courses is how impactful a visit to the woodlot on York University's land is for them. There's something about being with the land, um, putting your hands in the soil, getting a sense of the trees and the, the ground cover and the shrubs and the creatures that live alongside us is something that's really impactful for our students. So with that said, that is a brief EUC update. And of course, uh, thank you to our colleagues at the Faculty of Science um, with whom we have these wonderful collaborations. And today I'm going to, or now I'm gonna to introduce today's esteemed speakers. Um, Dr. Lawrence Packer uh, is an about to retire bee expert who's been at York for almost 35 years. He is a distinguished research professor from the Faculty of Science and has built and continues to maintain the largest Canadian collection of bees, currently estimated over 300,000 specimens from all around the world. Welcome to Lawrence. And Dr. Victoria McPhail has been working in the field of pollination for two decades and is currently the coordinator of BC at York. She's a PhD graduate of our faculty, EUC, and is also a founding member and current, and current co-chair of Pollinator Guelph, a grassroots volunteer run group dedicated to raising awareness of the importance of pollinators and pollinator habitat. Welcome, Victoria. I'm going to ask you to share your screens. You've already done so, Victoria. Uh, Lawrence, I don't know if that means uh, Victoria is starting, but there's Lawrence for you. Um, I see a shared screen coming up and putting it into slideshow view, no doubt. And yeah, then I will, like. yeah, no doubt. Um, and I will invite you to. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alice, for the great introduction. Um, yes, and Joanne for the earlier introduction. So as we're going to have a two-part presentation here, I'm going to start off talking about BC kind of uh, globally or broadly, and then Lawrence Pack will talk about the insect collection, the benefit of diversity and studying bees in general. So as Joanne mentioned, uh, BC it stands for Bee Ecology Evolution Conservation, and we're an initiative or a research unit here at York is trying to advance research in these fields. Basically anything to do with bees, we wanna study it and learn more about it. This is cross-disciplinary, it's cross faculties. So we have the Faculty of Science involved, and of course EUC, Mathematics and Statistics, History, and other faculty members, both on campus and across universities in Canada, the US, and more broadly. We also partner with ENGOs, industry members and government to really access the funds, the resources, expertise to answer these questions related to bees. And you see photos of our five executive members uh, on the slide here. So what do we study? Well, it's pretty broad. We have several different dis big disciplines. So ecology, biodiversity, 
math and statistics, biology, and social ecological systems. This means, again, everything related to bees, everything from going out in the field, looking to see what the bees are feeding on, how they're interacting, through to looking at genomics, looking at the genetic breakdown, looking at um, citizen science, getting community members involved in science, looking at modeling. It's really broad. And as I mentioned, it is inter interdisciplinary. We're also very collaborative. You can see our group of individuals who attended our conference uh, last October at the bottom of the slide. We're also very innovative. We are literally pioneering new techniques, especially in the genomics and eDNA fields. We work literally around the world, either physically going to these locations. For example, here in the slide, I have a picture from G. Lawrence in Chile, a picture from Italy where uh, Dr. Sheila Kohler currently is on sabbatical doing research, and a picture from Southern Ontario. But so specimens coming in from literally all around the world uh, that Lawrence will talk about later on. We look at all bee species and in, in general other pollinators too, but the focus is on bees, both the wild kind of native species as well as the managed or domesticated species. And the overall goal is really to ensure the long term sustainability of bees and the vital ecosystem services they provide, both in terms of our food for humans, as well as flowers and other resources for all the um, living creatures around the world. The first uh, researcher we're going to focus is Dr. Amro Zayed. As you may be aware, pollinators are facing a lot of threats, and one of them is health related, either related to diseases, pesticides, inbreeding, and more. And the neat thing about genomics is that you can understand some of these threats and help to develop tools to circumvent them. So, Dr. Zayed focuses a lot on honeybees, but looks at other bees as well. And they have a bee CSI program. So, just like human CSI, looking at what's happening here, and they do that for honeybees. Dr. Sandra Rehan is actually a world-renowned researcher for carpenter bees, and she actually has set them up to be a model system, showing that they can be a model system for behavioral genomics and biodiversity conservation. So this work is really helping us learn more about the relationship with the land and how we can then, you know, characterize these features and help restore the land even better, whether it's urban or agro ecosystems. And these carpenter bees are to the ones that actually dig the pith out of stems. So you can see here a picture of a little plant stem with a little bee digging out the pith to make its nest. Dr. Sheila Kola's lab is a bit more broad, focusing on all pollinators, not just uh, bumblebees, so that is a specialty. And they use conservation biology, policy, and community science to support evidence-based decision making for the conservation of these pollinators. If you want to get involved, if you take a picture of a bumblebee, Switch to bumblebeewatch.org and then other individuals help identify your photos. It gives us information about what bees are in the landscape and then how we can protect them better. But Lawrence Packers, we'll be hearing more from shortly. Uh, they focus their efforts on identifying the bees from all around the world, understanding their origins and connections. But the neat thing with this work is that it literally supports all the work that everybody else does. We could not do our research and pre present our findings without knowing these species, what they've identified them, and again, knowing the relationships and origins. We're not all about, you know, actually physical bees, so we actually do mathematical modeling. So Dr. Jane Heffernan has a really neat approach looking at epidemiology and in-host pathogen dynamics to look at identifying what are the factors affecting um, disease spread. Is it looking at the pathogens themselves, looking at the individuals and the populations? And able to use this modeling to help determine intervention strategies. So she was very heavily involved in COVID-19 pandemic, and it still is, but she does been looking at bee health, particularly with Amro Zayed. Dr. Elizabeth Clare uses DNA-based tools to address questions in ecology, everything from landscape change effects to feeding ecology and species interactions. And as I mentioned, innovativeness, they are very innovative, um, looking at metabarcoding and eDNA techniques. This technology is move from last year, two decades, um, from needing a whole specimen to look at the DNA of the species to identify it, through to now actually sampling from the air, something she's now uh, trialing out, vacuuming DNA out of the sky, which is a really neat approach, learning more about our um, species and our ecosystems. Dr. Jennifer Bonnell takes a historical approach to understanding bees, beekeepers, and environmental changes over time. So she did a really neat work recently looking at Beekeepers as early environmentalists in the early 1900s, they raised the sort of alarm about, hey, we're spraying these apple orchards with pesticides and suddenly the bees are dying off. There's no bees left. Um, so it's really neat looking back at the history and looking back into the future. 
slightly different approach is the Finding Flowers Project. This integrates art, ecology, and education for native pollinator and plant conservation. So it's uh, builds on the work by the Micmac artist Mike McDonald's and basically using art to con conserve pollinators. And it was, was done by Dr. Kohler and Dr. Myers. And a final kind of plug, I um, hope you find this interest. Um, this is very interesting work. And if you want to help students continue this work in the future, we're actually starting to set up a new memorial award uh, for Maria Stay, who is a former uh, York University staff member who sadly passed away recently. And so their family is setting up this award for grad students at York. Um, so I encourage you, if you're able to, to consider donating uh, to this fund through York University. You get a tax receipt as well as helping students. So consider you, if you're able to donate, uh, please do. And I'm going to turn over to Lawrence, the next part of our presentation. Hello, everybody. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Alice, and uh, also to uh, to Victoria. Let me. Where am I going here? Slideshow from beginning. So, can you all see this? Nobody's saying yes. anything. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So, uh, bees and the bee collection at York University, as I think was just illustrated, bees are in trouble. They're in trouble for all sorts of reasons, pesticides, urban growth, um, loss of habitat, climate change. Uh, one of the, you know, as a result of this, people have started to use funds to help, uh, to help bee research. Uh, but one of the main issues that bees suffer from is that everybody thinks they know what they are. Um, so this is the front cover, the North American edition of a book called The Bees of the World. And that is a fly on the cover. Both of the authors know that that is not a bee and they complain to the publisher and the publisher said, oh, no, it is a bee. We check with entomologists. Uh, so I wonder which entomologists they check with. So clearly people are confused about bees. And what do we normally think of when someone says the word bees? I imagine not things that look like this, but these are all bees. Um, so most bees do not make honey. Um, honey is probably the first thing that comes to mind when people mention the word bees, but most bees do not make honey. Uh, as busy as a bee is a commonly heard phrase, but some bees don't do any work at all. They're cuckoo bees that lay their eggs in the nests of other species. Uh, and then we've got queens, and I guess that's a bit of a philosophical question whether queens actually do any work other than laying eggs. Certainly Queen Elizabeth was known to work hard, but uh, queen bees, I'm not quite so sure. Most bees are solitary. So the general idea of bees living in complicated societies is actually true of a very tiny proportion of all of the species. Most bees uh, live entirely alone. Um, and very few of them nest in hives. Uh, I imagine most of you are too young to remember uh, beehive hairdos. These were very popular in the 1960s, but as most people that come to my talk are older even than I, talks are older even than I am, most of them will laugh at this, but the undergraduates haven't got the faintest idea what I'm talking about. Um, so here we see a honey beehive on the top right, but on the bottom left here, um, these all of these brown spots are uh, the result of a female bee digging down into the surface of the soil to make a burrow because she's going to produce a brood of offspring beneath the surface of the ground. There are 250 nests per square meter at this site. Most bees nest in the ground. Um, most of those that don't nest in pithy stems like the serotina that we just saw a picture of or, or in beetle burrows in wood. Uh, some of them nest in snail shells, as we can see here. Um, this one at the bottom right has finished nesting in a snail shell, and now what she's doing is hiding it with dry, dry twigs. Some bees build nests of resin on the fork in a branch of a, of a bush, and then this particular species or this particular individual has then covered the resin with, uh, with gravel so that it is defended from any potential natural enemies that might want to get at the brood on the inside. 
Uh, so most bees don't have any contact with their offspring. Um, they lay an egg and that's it. They will have collected all the food required for the development of that offspring from egg through to adult into a pollen ball uh, in a brood cell. The one on the top left there is in the ground. The one at the bottom right here is a leaf cutter or on the right is a, is a leaf cutter bee that's uh, built a nest in a cavity um, and lined the brood cell with leaf particles. So here we see an egg, here we see a larva, and here we see another larva, but the female that laid the egg will never see her offspring. And that's true for nearly all bee species, which is kind of surprising, perhaps. Uh, most bees don't sting. Um, male bees don't sting because uh, the sting is a modified egg laying apparatus and males don't lay eggs. Uh, but even females of many bee species have lost the ability to sting. Bottom left here, we've got a bee with a really long sting. Uh, that's the longest the sting in rela relation to its body size of any bee I know. The bottom right one here looks like a standard bee. It looks like it would be able to sting you. But the actual sting shaft, which is the part that would enter your body, is membranous. And so it wouldn't even be able to poke a hole in a in a wet piece of toilet paper. So um, many bees don't sting. So very few bees make honey, less than 4% of them, less than 8% are social. Almost none of them nest in hives. Lots of them are cuckoos that lay in nests of others and uh, only females sting and even 15% of them have lost the ability to do that. So I imagine by now you're a little bit confused because well, what are bees? Bees are vegetarian digger wasps. So on the right here, we see a digger wasp that's paralyzed a caterpillar. That's the original function of a sting is to paralyze food so that it doesn't thrash around in the brood cell that the mother will uh, lay an egg into um, and it won't damage the offspring um, as it develops. Uh, pollen doesn't need to be subdued in that way. And so that's one of the reasons why bees have had the ability to lose uh, uh, through evolutionary time, have repeatedly lost the ability to sting. Um, so how do we tell bees from other organisms? And this answer isn't gonna be very satisfactory. Bees have got branched hairs and wasps that they're related to do not. Um, yes, it is difficult telling bees apart from other organisms in many cases in many parts of the world. So there's over 20,700 described species of bees. Uh, the 20,000th was described by Sheila Demesh in 2013. Um, there are over 850 in Canada. There's about 400 in Southern Ontario, yeah, 350 maybe. Bees are important. Here's uh, breakfast with bees. I should add milk to this. 15% of beef and dairy in Canada is brought to us as a result of the pollination activities of bees and not the honeybee. Uh, that is brought to us by the alfalfa leaf cutter bee, um, which is a species that is very effective at pollinating alfalfa. And alfalfa is a common winter fodder crop for cattle. So that's why 15% of milk and dairy is brought to you by bees. So even if you don't like to eat your fruits and vegetables, you still need bees. So here's breakfast with bees. Here's breakfast without bees. It looks dreadful. Um, fruits and nuts and berries are all gone. Uh, there's still some coffee because coffee plants self-pollinate, but you get much less of a yield if there aren't bees around to carry pollen from one plant to another. So if it weren't for bees, there'd be even more people cranky on a in the morning because they wouldn't be able to afford coffee. Uh, so it's been said that about a third of our food is brought to us as a result of bees. Well, I think that's probably a bit of an exaggeration, but certainly bees are really important. And there's this statement that's been attributed to Albert Einstein. If the bee disappeared off the surface of the globe, man would have only four years of life left. Woman being more adopt adaptable might have six. Einstein scholars can find no evidence that he ever said anything of the sort. Um, but what we can tell from this picture is he had absolutely no idea what bees look like. So without bees, no nuts, no berries. Without, no nut, without nuts and berries, no birds, no bears. Bees are essential not only for our food, but also for the functioning of 
all of the world's terrestrial ecosystems that aren't covered in ice all year round. So the bee collection at York is enormous. Um, I haven't counted the number of specimens. People tell me it's probably about, it's probably over 350,000. Um, there are 25 tall cabinets like these ones here. Uh, there are 20 or so short ones like this. Um, it's used by researchers all over the world. I've got multiple loans out to researchers on pretty much all continents at the moment. Um, and obviously a, a lot of people in the US also. Uh, we've got a state-of-the-art digital imaging system, which some of the pictures I am showing you uh, were taken with. Um, but what about the actual specimens on the inside? Um, there's a lot. Um, bees are divided into seven families. Uh, as of this morning, I checked the online database and there's 20,759 species. I'm not entirely sure what proportion of those species I have, but I've got 90% of the world's 554 bee genera. And this I built up over the last 25 years from nothing. So from nothing I built up what is arguably at least equally the most diverse collection of bees on the planet in terms of the number of bee genera represented. Um, it's possible that the British Museum of Natural History, one of the oldest collections ever, might have something similar to this. Maybe one or two other museums where people have been collecting bees for a century or so, um, but I don't know any that are significantly larger and more diverse than mine. We've described uh, two new genera from, from the collection. Uh, and for some other, uh, for some genera, we have the only specimens outside the country of origin, such as this Megascurtetica mephistophelica. It gets that name as a result of it being so black. Um, this is another bee that I uh, is the only specimen outside of South Africa. Um, and I collected this. Or the dates there, 1998, maybe 99. This is the only specimen of the entire genus, not the only species, it's the only specimen. Um, this single individual is the only evidence we have for 35 million years of bee evolution because this species diverged from uh, the next genus along. Uh, over 35 million years ago. I've gone back to the same spot multiple times trying to find more, but alas, haven't been able to find it. Um, of the 20,759, my lab's described almost 200. Uh, here's some of the ones, some of the papers are listed here. Th you know, one new species there, three there, 21 new species there. Um, naming species is fun. And if it's done correctly, the name will be in use for as long as people are around. Um, this is the most entertaining name I ever came up with. It's Calioptis rigor mortis, and it would be got that name because it's got an unusual death posture. And that is a result of it having to force its way into some very tight flowers. So it's got some very strong muscles, which when rigor mortis sets in, gives it an unusual posture. I've got hundreds more species to describe, which is what I'm hoping to do in my retirement. There's over 30 species in this genus, about 10 in this one, 20 in that one, and over 40 in that one. And anybody donating sufficient funds to the charity that Victoria mentioned earlier will be given naming rights uh, to say who, what name they want to give some of these species. Uh, and then that name will last forever, uh, or at least as long as people do. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, all I can say is, wow, uh, thank you, uh, both Lawrence and Victoria. And I wonder if, Victoria, you want to pop back on. There we go. Um, incredible presentation. Um, uh, it was a wonderful balance between a Bees 101 and some myth busting. Um, but I think uh, the message coming out loud and clear that bees are important and what we're doing at York University through these wonderfully interdisciplinary, multifaceted, multi-sectoral collaborations is the foundational science piece, which Lawrence um, and his bee collection exhibits beautifully. And then the work from BC um, to really continue to further the knowledge about bees. Um, thank you so much. 
Um, so I have questions, but I would love to op open this up to um, anyone who's in the audience. You can see the Q&A button on your screen. Um, I, I actually see already, so I encourage you to get in there to ask some questions. We have about you know, 10 to 15 minutes, so good time to kind of ponder what you might have. Um, uh, Wow, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll leave my questions for a moment. So I'm going to go to um, Angela Locante, who um, offered a question. And she's actually wondering if you, Dr. Packer, uh, do presentations to community groups, especially lifelong learning organizations for older adults. So a third age um, community. I can imagine. Yeah, I've, I've, done, I've done lots of this. Yeah. Um, although only one since the pandemic started but mm -hmm. in an average year I will give several of these talks yeah what is and, and as a follow-up question I'd love to know to what extent you have be education uh, as part of your mandate as a scientist um well I I'm involved in lots of online things. Um, I te I was involved teaching a course, an international bee identification workshop every two years uh, in Arizona, but I've not done that for a while now. But I am one of the co-authors on the textbook for that that's being revised as we speak. Um, there's lots of bee education and materials and images uh, available on my website. If you just Google Packer and Bugs R Us, B-U-G-S-R-U-S, you'll get there. Actually, I can share the screen and show how to get there if people want. Let's see if I can do this without losing contact. Uh, meanwhile, ask me another question because I'm. I, yes, it's going to take me a while to find <laughs> Sounds myself good. around. <laughs> okay, we'll continue on in the questions. Um, what is the thing you find most fascinating about bees and which is your favorite bee? And I will invite uh, both Lawrence and Victoria to offer their thoughts. Lawrence is multitasking right now, so I'll yeah. jump in. Um, so many things fascinating about bees. They're super, super cool and awesome. Um, I love how they can find flowers no matter where in the landscape they are. Depending, some species can actually only forge you know, a few hundred meters away. Some like the bumblebees and honeybees can go a few kilometers away. But I find it really neat for them to find what's flowering and be able to find that continually. And flowers change out every day. There are flowers open. So every day, even over the course of the day, they're always searching for new flowers and able to find it. Um, so I think that's really pretty cool. They're able to collect the, the pollen to bring it back to their colonies or to provision their nests. Uh, my favorite bees are probably the bumblebees. I spent a lot of time studying those. I find they're super neat. They're really sort of fuzzy, furry. Um, and they can travel several kilometers. And they do have that sort of youth social behavior. Um, but they have to have a queen and colony for part of the year, although only queens are in the springtime. So in the very right now, it's literally just the queen starting up a new colony, and then she'll start laying eggs, producing workers. And at the end of the year, all those die off, except for the brand new queens and males are being produced. So they kind of start, out, start from scratch every year. So I find it's really neat as well. Thank you, Victoria. That sounds like a very dynamic experience that you have uh, gathered in, in your years in this field. Um, Lawrence, how are you doing on your multitasking? And if can you, you see to... this, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. I think so so yeah. this is one of my favorite bees. Okay. Um, I, I just find it just very handsome color pattern. Um, there are others that I like also. Um, one of my favorites is, let's see. Whoops, gone too far. This one. Look at the tongue on that. So that goes that goes to flowers with where the nectar is uh, at the end of a very deep and narrow tube, and so the bee has to have a remarkably long tongue to be able to access it. And de plants that grow in deserts have to kind of hide their nectar because it would otherwise dry out really quickly. Wow. Um, a question has come in that relates to that to some extent, I could imagine. Um, which are the best bees for apple cultivation or mango cultivation? Pretty specific. Well, so in, in ap apples, apples in New York, um, I think there's over 40 species of, of wild bees that uh, have been shown to be visiting apple flowers in, in New York. There's a lot of uh, solitary mining bees in the genus Andrina that are really good at uh, pollinating apples. 
Uh, mangoes, I'm not quite so sure of. I think stingless bees are, are, are important for them. Um, so stingless bees are related to honeybees, but they don't sting. Um, and they also produce honey, but rather small amounts of it. But it is much more delicious than honeybee honey. Uh, so if you get the chance to taste some, and you can buy it if you travel to Mexico um, and other parts of Latin America, um, it's particularly uh, many species are grown in Brazil. Unfortunately, when it's almost impossible to get it sent to us from Brazil, uh, but a friend of mine has got 20 different species producing honey um, in his operation, and I'd love to get hold of the, the, the honey from those. Wow, thank you for that answer. Um, maybe we'll turn to Victoria with this one. So it's quite broad. Well, it's broad, it's not broad. It's, a, it, it's, it's an important question. Um, Scott Mitchell writes, uh, we've heard lots in the media about the mysterious dying off of bee colonies. Does the incredible diversity of bees that you've described uh, offer hope for the preservation of bees on earth, uh, despite uh, humans' persistent use of pesticides and other toxic behaviors? That's a good question, Scott. It's sort of a tricky one in a sense, or tricky to answer in terms of, I doubt humanity would kill off every single bee species on the planet unless we do a really bad job, like nuclear ap apocalypse type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but the really more important question to ask is, do we want to preserve our bees? Like some people take the approach of, oh, okay, we have, you know, 856 different species of bees in Canada. It's okay if, you know, 50 or 100 of them die off. Um, for me, that's kind of a wrong approach, thinking, oh, we have other bees, it's okay. I think we should try to protect all of our bee species. So we don't really know the value of the species. Well, there's a value for them, some people would argue, for just existing as, as a species. They have the right to exist and survive despite our, our efforts. But there's also the impacts on the environment. So you may think, there's a recent paper of bumblebees. You think, okay, there's five species, five species of bumblebees here. It's okay if we lose one. But they found that removing one actually in, impacted the seeds of the flower. So even though you had five species going to the flowers, but removing that one species, it kind of impacted the whole interaction effects and actually negatively impacted the flower. So I think bees would survive um, our human efforts, but it's not a reason to kind of give up our protection or our conservation efforts. So, um, yeah. If I could ask you to build on that with um, perhaps helping our audience um, make the links between the climate crisis, which we hear clearly a lot about, and bee conservation, it'd be sort of a broad sketch, recognizing it's very complicated, but. Um, yeah, sort of a very high can... level. Think about what climate change is happening. Think about what we hear in the media. Think about um, weird temperature swings. Think of wildflower, wildfires. We're having droughts um, that impacts the bees in terms of there's no food for them. So when the flowers are shriveling up due to heat or due to wildfires, then obviously the bees enough for the feed on. Or if we have springtime snowstorms or frosts, again, that can kill off the flowers that the bees are feeding on. We have sudden rainstorms or um, the opposite are droughts, but having an increase in moisture that again can wash out colonies. Again, bees nest in the ground, a lot of them, so that can actually flood out their nests. Uh, then you have in if issues with disease transfer can happen a lot more, more invasive species come into an area. So climate change, change does have a big impact in all sorts of um, avenues. Uh, temperature impacts reproductive success, impacts uh, there's, there are thresholds for stress tolerance. Um, so there's a lot of different things to be concerned about. So uh, climate change is actually one of the biggest stressors and threats to bees and pollinators in general right now. We like to think about oh, pesticides in Ontario, neonicotinoids have been in the media a lot. They are important. We do need to take action to protect our bees from pesticides, but climate change is a really big threat, threat and something we can all take action towards. So, you know, one more reason to take action for climate change. Mm. And I'll ask you one more related, and then we'll come back to Lawrence for a few questions. Um, and this comes from uh, Helen Prince in the audience. Are there any groundbreaking treatments on the horizon for varroa mites? Varroa mites, and uh, is the B BC uh, doing any research on this? I mean, I mean Lawrence to jump in. I'm not sure yeah. if Amber's doing anything with varroa directly for treatments. Mm. I don't think we're doing anything directly. Lawrence can correct me if I'm wrong. There. I think I think you're right. Uh, Amro is working on all sorts of genetic uh, adaptations of honeybees. Uh, for example, increased hygienic behavior, and that's something that will help uh, the bees 
uh, get rid of the mites without any chemical treatment. But mm -hmm. he's also looking at all of the other um, genetic responses of bees to all of the nasty things in the environment, diseases, uh, chemicals, uh, temperature changes, um, looking at the ways that you know, his aim is to breed a better bee, to which I would say there are already 20,500 better bees, but I'm a bias. <laughs> Um, Laura, it's a, um, a bit of a two-part question for you. Um, how easy is it to identify um, a, a bee to species? And why is it important to have more than one male and one female specimen of any species? Okay, those are great questions. Um, how easy it is depends upon which group of bees it is. If it's a genus with, rare, with only one species, once you've got the genus identified, then there's, you also know what the species is. Um, if it's a genus with hundreds or even thousands of species, then it's extremely difficult. And there are plenty of bee genera um, where the number of people capable of identifying all the species is sometimes as low as one. Uh, actually, sometimes it's less than one because there's nobody that can identify them. So there's a bee genus called Spacodes, and uh, there's only one person that can identify the North American ones, and almost nobody can identify them from anywhere else in the world. Um, what was the second part of the question? It was so, um, yeah. about um, having at least uh, ah, yes, more right. than one male and one female special. Um, okay, good. Okay. Um, the, the issue there is what starts off being one species often ends up being more than that once you've got more specimens to compare. So if I just had one male and one female of each of the species um, that were known before um, I started working on, on bees, then I wouldn't have been able to discover as many of the new species as I have. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is to get some species that you've got lots of specimens of so you get an idea of what the natural variation is within that group and then you can look for outliers that are obviously outside the range of that variation and that difference kind of helps you calibrate everything else brilliant thank you so much um, we have time for maybe one more question. So I will um, ask Phyllis's question, Phyllis Davis in the audience. Um, and this is more in the, this uh, sounds like it's a bit in the myth busting range. So let's, uh, let's hear your thoughts on this, either Victoria or Lawrence. Uh, the public is often made afraid of bees by the stories of invasions by killer bees from the South. Um, any truth to this? Well, um... To be killed by uh, so-called killer bees, you have to try pretty hard. Um, so if you got a whole colony of, of, of these and you bump your head on it, then they'll come out and you'll get stung so many times, it could be bad for your health. The issue with these particular, this is a strain of honeybee. And the issue with them is that their threshold for mass attack is very low. So in other words, you're at all of the honeybees around here and in, in, in the northern US and throughout Europe um, and elsewhere where we've taken them, except South America and Central America and the southernmost states where the aggressive strain occurs. Um, it, you have to really disturb a hive for more than a few individuals to come out and sting you. Whereas if you walk close to um, a killer bee, that, um, uh, strain hive, it's quite likely that quite a lot will come out and sting you. The main problem happens when, for example, a tree falls over and it's got one of these hives in it and the bees think it's the people nearby that have caused the collapse of, of the tree and they will attack them. Uh, but by, you know, m m it's you know, getting stung by honeybees is painful um, mm. and you can build up an allergy to it. So before you become a bee expert, if you're gonna spend a lot of time going outdoors and handling bees, uh, you should go see an allergy specialist to make sure that you're not allergic to bee stings. When I'm doing field work, I get stung on average once a day and I only get annoyed if I get stung in the same place twice or more. Um, <laughs> otherwise I'm just fine. 
We just jump and remind people at Lauren said in his talk that virtually most, the vast majority of bees do not sting. So it's kind of the honeybee and lesser scent, the bumblebee that will sting. And the other 848 species or 800 odd species in Canada will not sting you. And even for the bumblebees, especially, they will leave you alone. Unless you're actively disturbing the nest, they aren't going to hurt you. Um, so again, I haven't been stung nearly as many times as Lawrence. I have had some stings in the field, but usually when I'm being less careful or doing something like catching six or eight bees in my net, stick my hands out of the net when I have six bees in there and forget about one bee, um, get stung. But um, killer bees are coming up from the, from the southern states, but as Lawrence said, it is really just the southern states. They haven't made it up to the northern climate. They just really can't handle the cold, the cold temperatures just yet. So. Dr. Victoria McPhail, Dr. Lawrence Packer, it's been a pleasure spending this time with you. Thank you so much for that fantastic presentation. I'm gonna turn things over to Joanne uh, to close us off. Thank you, Alice, for moderating. And thank you, Lawrence and Victoria for your amazing presentations and dispelling all these myths about the bees. We greatly appreciate it. Um, so before we say goodbye to those in our audience today, thank you once all again for taking the time out to join us uh, for our Scholars Hub at Home um, series. Uh, we have one last poll question for you, and that question is going to pop up right now. It's how would you rate your knowledge of today's topic following the insightful discussion that was just shared? Um, so I see that folks are answering the question. Amazing. We are seeing that there's a lot of improvement. So that's fantastic. Thank you so much for responding to that poll. We have so many great lectures in store for you this spring. So please be sure to check out our website for more details. Our next session will be on Wednesday, June 7th at 12 noon. We invite you to join us for the session titled From Challenged Inclusion, LGBTQ plus asylum seekers, refugees, and mental health with Nick Mule, um, sexuality studies, oh, excuse me one second, a sexuality studies coordinator and professor and this, from the School of Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. For more information about our Scholars Hub at Home series and as well as all the other virtual events, uh, please visit our website at yorku.ca slash alumni and friends. Do feel free to share today's talk and all of our Scholars Hub home events uh, with you, uh, with your friends and your networks. It will be posted on our York Alumni YouTube channel and the link is in the chat. Thank you all so much. Be well and have a great long weekend ahead. Bye now.